This next video is of Leon Eplin. Leon Eplin uh, lived in Ansley Park from the early 1960s until around 2010 or 2011. Uh, he is still a vibrant, active person, uh, but Leon uh, was involved with developing the first neighborhood plan for Ansley Park that was the first neighborhood plan in the country. And Leon did this at the request of one of the uh, people who was involved with the leadership of the neighborhood in the 1960s. But it came about uh, because at the, that time in the 1960s, it was almost impossible to get a mortgage uh, in Ansley Park. Ansley Park was basically redlined uh, by the banks because they feared that it was going to be overrun by commercialized properties, uh, that the houses were decaying, they were basically being divided up into boarding houses. Uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. Uh, ladies of the night uh, had their uh, little places uh, here in Ansley Park. It was a different kind of neighborhood in the 1960s. And Leon came up with the idea of developing a plan using the zoning and building uh, codes to prevent further commercialization of the neighborhood. And he, along with Tom Branch, who was uh, again a longtime resident of Ansley Park and an attorney, uh, would use the neighborhood plan as a means of protesting any kind of commercial development uh, or any type of effort to divide houses into boarding houses. Uh, and there's also a tape that we have of a, an evening with Tom Branch and Leon Eplin that the Neighborhood Association put together in 2010. It's on the website and I commend that to you if you want to get a better appreciation for the efforts of both Leon Eplin and Tom Branch. But Leon gives a wonderful overview of what it was like to be at the forefront of the effort to safeguard the neighborhood in the 1960s and 70s. And also, he was involved with a handful of people who came up with a statement that Ansley Park was going to welcome all kinds of people to the neighborhood. They were not going to run away from people of a different color or a different uh, race or religion. Uh, and they were committed to staying in Ansley Park. This may not sound that revolutionary now, but in the 1960s and early 70s, there was a great white flight uh, in inner, inner city neighborhoods uh, out of fear of integration. Uh, and the people like Leon Eplin uh, made a stand and said, we are not going to run away from any kind of problems. We're not afraid of integration. We're not afraid of different cultures living here in the neighborhood and we welcome that kind of diversity, which again is one of the characteristics of Ansley Park today. But it's as a result of the efforts by people like Leon Eplin who made that possible. So I think you'll enjoy his perspective. After the war, Atlanta had an enormous shortage of housing. Um, we had not built housing in Atlanta during the, the depression and into the war. So uh, by 1950, there was only a one half of one percent vacancy rate in Atlanta. And some of the neighborhoods like Ansley Park with its big old homes began to be divvied up into from single family into multifamily. And uh, soon thereafter the decline set in. These big homes were very difficult to maintain. And with the overcrowding that began to occur because of the housing shortage, uh, the area began to deteriorate very rapidly. I moved in in the uh, early 60s, in 1961, and uh, it was difficult to get a loan uh, made in this area. I went to several houses, uh, even with a large down payment. Uh, they were refused to make loans because the history of Atlanta was that when an area began to decline um, and deteriorate, uh, we thought it would be, become a slum and we would clear it and it would become a shopping center or something. So there was no thought that people would come back to the city and into these housing to live. And so there was no inclination to, to rebuild uh, and to um, lend money to, to fix up your houses. So it was very difficult to get a loan. Um, I ended up by having to put down a very large amount of equity just to get a loan. But we moved in, and um, because there was uh, a lot of space, I loved the, the parks and the and the beauty of the place. Uh, I remember my mother-in-law came by to see the house and she wanted to know where the young people lived. 
why am I moving into this old neighborhood that she had moved out of in her city. But it was something that attracted me to. I had been a, had lived here all my life and nearby, and Ansley Park was always a glorious place. So we moved in along with a lot of other people who wanted the space at very cheap prices. Uh, people who were worked in the newspapers, I remember. A lot of, of our newspaper people lived here. People with larger families. Uh, what precipitated the uh, growth and return was uh, in 1963, um, the, a, a fellow who was one of the vice presidents of, of the CNS Bank, uh, Jim Furness, called up the president of the Civic Association, Jim Moore, and asked him to come in and talk to him about the future of Ansley Park. They were very concerned about what happens to their loans that they had outstanding. And he suggested that if, if um, the Civic Association would uh, undertake a plan, they would put up a thousand dollars if they would match it toward a plan. And so uh, Jimmy Moore, who was an attorney, a very distinguished attorney in those days, uh, said fine. He went home and he called me. I had just moved in and got to know him. He and he told me about the story and he asked me, uh, "Is that what you do? You do you do planning?" I said, "Yeah, that's what I do." He said, "Can you do a plan for Ensley Park?" I said, "Yes, I could do." So he says, "What would you charge?" And I thought for a while, and I said, it was going to have to be more than $2,000, but it would be only a few thousand dollars more. And he said, fine. And I forgot about it. And three weeks later, Jim called me back, and he says, let's get started. I got the money. I says, I, I knocked on the doors of the fat cats, whom we regarded as the old-time families here, and he raised the money, and, and we did a plan. We, did a, we divided the, uh, the neighborhood up into blocks, and people and block committees, uh, block committees, and and everyone participated in putting together the plan. And in 1964, we put out the the um, revitalization plan for Ansley Park. And uh, CNS came up with the idea that they would lend money to people who would uh, fix up their house and would come in with plans, and they would make a loan on the appraised value of the fixed up house, so that you could get practically. 100% uh, loans because the value would go up and so they were making 80% loans or whatever they were making and uh, which were much above what the value present value was and so people were coming in and CNS owes we owe a lot to CNS because they're the ones who came up with this neat idea of um, of appraising the the finish product and they were assured they were going to finish the house and uh, I've always regarded it as something that we ought to still do around the city which no other bank that I know have ever done so we owe a lot to Jim Moore he was an inspiration he really went out and got the organization together he really was the first of the modern presidents of of um, Ansi Park Civic Association under that up to that time mostly uh, most Mostly the presidents were run by the president of the Garden Club or something. But Jimmy whipped the, uh, the group into shape, got very enthusiastic, raised the money, and went out and sold, sold the idea of Ansley Park. We got in the newspapers, and um, with that plan, we were able to go down to City Hall, which had just um, only recently adopted their first zoning ordinance in 1956. And so, and some building codes, which prevented people from from divvying up the houses anymore. Uh, that's, that's a very recent occurrence. Uh, it only happened in the 60s, on, on the, in, the, in, the, in the early 60s, the housing codes came in under the new society programs. And so we had some legal um, standing behind us to b begin to protect the houses from any further um, uh, subdiv subdividing. And, and so people began to come back in, the banks began to lend money. And that's really how we began to draw a lot of young people uh, back into the neighborhood. It was at that time occupied primarily either by uh, the old families that had been there since uh, the early days of the you know, 20s and so forth, or by people who had come in to divide up the houses as, as, uh, as, as landlords. This new group of people, they were enthusiastic. This was a major investment. They were able to get loans for the first time. And so that began to draw people back into the neighborhood in big numbers. And um, it, it was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of excitement. We got a good support from the city council. 
um, Richard Freeman, the federal judge, was head of the zoning committee of city council. And it was Richard Freeman who, who said, if this neighborhood wants to do such and such, they've got a plan of how they want, want to rebuild, and we're going to, sh to follow them. At that time, there was no such thing as a neighborhood plan or, or any neighborhood participation in, in city affairs. And so uh, Ansley Park was really a pioneer of, of the neighborhood movement of getting neighborhoods to begin to articulate what they want for the future and participate in public decision making. Uh, later on, when we organized the the uh, process we use in the city now, the neighborhood planning unit process, um, Ansley Park was really the model that was used to begin to to organize neighborhoods to coagulate the several neighborhoods into the neighborhood planning units. Ansley Park was was really important to the turning around the city from the abandonment and the disinvestments that took place to where we're now beginning to reclaim the city and is return it to um, a neighborhood consciousness that we didn't have before. Starting in the 60s when we began to grow along Peachtree Street, there was a number of office buildings uh, built to that there. And, uh, and so the office buildings changed the land uses and they began to exert some pressure on the houses that backed up the Peachtree Street uh, fronting on, on Peachtree Circle. Uh, a number of developers did not put enough parking in and so they were interested in buying houses along Peachtree Circle and tearing those down to uh, build parking, uh, to extend their parking to give provide enough parking for the new office buildings that were on, uh, being place on Peachtree. Uh, Ansley Park had established the the alley between the par uh, the uh, in the back of the of the office buildings as the extent of the neighborhood and so when we went in with the with to the zoning committees of the city uh, to fight these parking lots that were proposed you know, on Peachtree Circle we the plan allowed us to us to demonstrate that we had established land and uh, Richard Freeman who was chairman of the Planning Commission at the time, now a federal judge, um, you know, confirmed that we had established a boundary and, the, and that you could not cr uh, cross that line. So that we began to protect the houses, the most, the most vulnerable houses and those that were next to our commercial districts. The same thing occurred at one of the early original MARTA alignments as MARTA moved northward uh, in their planning for uh, the North Line was to that it uh, one line went right through the houses on Peachtree Circle originally. And in fact, those were appraised by um, Stuart Ward, who was one of our neighbors, uh, who was the appraiser for the MARTA uh, operations. And he appraised every house along Peachtree Circle with the thought that, they, uh, that MARTA might go through those houses because they were old and no one really cared about them anyhow. So it, we, were, we were really faced with a lot of battles. One of the turning points was the house at the uh, Peachtree Circle across from, the Wind, uh, from uh, Wind Park, uh, Franny Lee's house. She came in uh, very early on as one of the um, first people to redevelop a house, and she wanted to redevelop and put a lot of money, we thought at the time, into her house. But she wanted to create two apartments upstairs and some uh, garage apartments behind. And of course, that was not single family, and there was a lot of resistance. But it was clear that this was the first major monies coming in to restore a house in Ansley Park. And so we decided to go along with her, which I thought was a good use, particularly since it was a good barrier to the commercial districts behind her. Uh, uh, the first house that was restored was the Martins house on, on Westminster. And uh, Henry Hova, Hova Daniel Busby, who was the architect for that, and in several other houses uh, in Ansley Park, uh, Bob London's house uh, he redid on uh, Lafayette. He was the architect on, on um, Colony Square. But he, he, was, he had a wonderful flair for design. He did theater sets, a very uh, uh, marvelous personality. And uh, he, did, he did a great job on the Martin House, which, uh, which really began to, to get people to understand what could be done by taking some of these houses that were pretty run down at the time and 
transformed into something of great beauty. Uh, one of the threats, uh, it wasn't, we had several threats to the vitality to, we finally were able to, to withstand change that was occurring in the Atlanta after the war, was, uh, had to do with the racial situation. Uh, we were going through some racial transitions in the 50s and 60s, and when the, the, um, the Civil Rights Act uh, of 65 came in, where, I, where you could not discriminate in, in your housing uh, was adopted. There was a great fear among some of the people living here, uh, old Southerners, that blacks would begin to move into the neighborhood and, and uh, destroy the, the property values. And there was a great consternation on their part of, of a large number of people about what the future really was, 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 uh, was this going to really uh, thwart our ability to to restore the neighborhood. And uh, Jim Moore, who was president of the Civic Association at the time, uh, you know, organized uh, with myself and a few others a committee, a petition committee, we met in my, in my living room, I remember so clearly, um, to pass around a petition stating that uh, the, the people who signed below uh, are going to stay in the, in the neighborhood and welcome whoever want to move into the neighborhood. That was sort of a veiled kind of uh, statement that um, if, if blacks moved in, that, that they would be welcome as much as anyone else. As, as innocent as that sounds today, that was really quite a, a statement uh, in those days. Something that, uh, and the leadership of Jim Moore was responsible for that as well. But we went around and we managed to get some of the, the um, old line names to um, who lived in the Ansley Park to sign the petition. We put those names at the top so that it allowed others to um, to shore up their courage to also uh, sign it. But we, we got a large, large number of people to sign. And it was a statement of uh, that I feel very proud of, uh, of Ansley Park. I think it, it was, uh, it brought us together in a, in a very meaningful way in Ansley Park. Uh, that had um, long-term uh, benefits. Not many people recognize the change that Atlanta is experiencing now, that we are beginning to, to become a different kind of city. Uh, I begin that history starting in 1982 when we began to come out of the recession that we had been in for several years. When we began to see development come back to the city, and it really came back in the early 80s in Buckhead, and then in the middle 80s and late 80s um, into Midtown, and now as we come into the 90s, it's moving downtown. It's coming um, in the, and in its wake, we're beginning to see people coming back to the city to, to occupy the jobs. But for, this is the first time in perhaps four decades that people are beginning to come back and live in the city and work in the city and rebuild the city. Uh, we tend to make it, we have a very short attention span in this country about, uh, about when uh, benefits are, are realized or changes occur. And they generally are at most three or three to five years, but this is historic and this, you have to look at a, uh, uh, decades and what we're seeing that from the first time since uh, World War II we're beginning to see the re, re, -happening, re inhabiting of Atlanta and it's coming it's benefiting uh, Ansley Park in in substantial ways um, because it's putting a putting us in the downtown area downtown has leaped from the traditional area around five points and then uptown to, to uh, out to Pershing Point. So that the downtown now stretches from, from the lower part of downtown all the way out to Pershing Point. And we are in fact a, a, an attachment to the new downtown area. There are not many places in America where you can live in this sort of suburban and uh, pastoral kind of setting. Uh, in this kind of housing that is so close to the downtown of a major city in America. And so what you're seeing in Ansley Park is that since we waited this long is the 
uh, we've been rewarded by having those of us who like the city, who really enjoy um, uh, taking part in the in the variety and the change. We the, the change is catching up with us. So those of us who've been here for for several decades are now seeing that the that the city is coming. The downtown area and the urban area is coming to to us, and that we're living now on the fringe of that, and we enjoy we can begin to enjoy uh, the restaurants and the theater and the Martis line, and all of the the variety that occurs uh, in what is now uptown. So that the future of of Ansley Park is very similar to uh, to a few other places in the country. Georgetown comes to mind, but there are areas of Toronto and of San Francisco that are, are very very. Um, much like this. There's always a need to uh, protect the, the, the neighborhood. Uh, we, have a, um, we have an obligation, I think as a community, to maintain the community. Uh, we've always had a history of keeping up our parks and our squares and to, and to plant trees and to to take care of the public spaces. Uh, I'm afraid that the city does not have a lot of money to do that. And um, because this is a, a, um, a prosperous neighborhood, we're going to have to supplement the public services in order to maintain the level of uh, excellent uh, quality of our environment that we've known and enjoy. We have to be ready to to participate in that uh, financially as well as personally in, in making certain that this environment is maintained. Um, it is not, it is not, a, a, the urban environment is always subject to attack and, and um, diminishing its quality. And all we have to do is to make certain that we, we maintain the quality here uh, because the city is, is not going to be able to uh, to deal with the quality of life in neighborhoods like ours when we have half the population living in such poverty and where we have to give our resources over to to the people who really are in great need. So um, the danger, if I have, if it is a danger, is that we might uh, take for granted what we have. Um, but we have a history of, of not doing that. The, the newspaper alone that tends to unite us and give us our commitments uh, will help uh, uh, guarantee that we won't uh, allow a, um, um, a feeling of apathy to, to spread. I had a, uh, when I did the plan for, for, the, for the restoration of Ansley Park in 63 and 64, um, my first plan I came up with was a street narrowing program. At that time, people, the only solution to problems was that you widen streets. And I came up with a solution that would, uh, that we would uh, narrow our streets. And people thought that was, that was sort of silly. My, th my uh, thought was that we would put medians in, the, in our wide streets, thereby discouraging movement. Uh, when you narrow a street, you slow the traffic. You not only cut down on its capacity, uh, but you also slow traffic because people are, fear, are fearful. When you widen streets, people speed up because they think they're safe. So I, I, I wanted to put medians in all of our largest. Uh, that uh, did not float too well because it meant we would have to come up with some money. So my alternative traffic solution, which I still uh, hold to as, as uh, something we ought to think about, is that uh, people are very confused about Ansley Park streets. We always, people are, are fearful. They find one route through and they always, for the rest of their lives, they, they use that one route in case they get lost. How well you can raise a child in a city. And that that's one of the standards that I always measure, the, the quality of life. But we also ought to plan our cities as if we were children. And that, so therefore we have wide sidewalks, we have parks, the, the idea of a median is that we have, in order to attract young people back in the, into Ansley Park in those days, was that it would provide a, a, a safer movement of children across the, the wide streets with the speeding cars, as well as the older people who have to start uh, halfway. I, at the time, I had uh, young children. Now that I've gotten old, I appreciate the, the second uh, a little better.